On Saturday, November 3rd, thousands of people will gather at Learn to Homebrew Day sites worldwide to brew beer and learn about the hobby of homebrewing. To find an event near you or to register to host your own celebration, visit homebrewersassociation.org. Share the joys of brewing your own beer. Make plans to celebrate Learn to Homebrew Day this November 3rd. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, October 11th, 2018. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, home brewer Tommy Calluat introduces us to makoli, or Korean rice wine. Tommy made the process sound so easy, I tried it myself. And I'll let you know how my first batches are turning out. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows, our DVDs, our brewers' logbooks, and other basic brewing gear, including our uh, tie-dye silicone pints. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook. We have a cool basic brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com, and we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. If you'd do us a favor of rating us on iTunes and maybe leaving a nice comment, they say that new listeners will find us more easily in that manner. If you support us financially, if you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And uh, thanks to all the new subscribers who are helping out. If, if you go to basicbrewing or patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access, including uh, early uh, uh, early access to episodes, video episodes, uh, behind-the-scenes episodes, recipes, such as that. So if you sign up as a supporter, You'll be helping us out in that way. Uh, I've mentioned in the in the opening there that I've begun to make makoli. Uh, I have one batch in the bottle in the fridge, and I started a second batch yesterday. And I'm going to wait until after the interview with Tommy to give you all the details. Uh, but I can tell you that it is delicious stuff. Uh, I've never had any other example of it, so I can't tell you if it's if it's like other homebrewed or commercial examples, but I do like what I got. So um, after being intimidated by the uh, sake-making process, I do feel sort of empowered. Uh, So, again, stay tuned after the interview for more details on my first batches. I did some searching online to see if anybody's making makoli commercially in the U.S., and I found Girin. I believe that's the way you pronounce it, G-I-R-I-N, a Korean steakhouse in Seattle. Uh, They're making it in-house. So uh, I called uh, or uh, texted. No one calls anymore. I texted texted the link uh, to the information uh, to my son, Drew, who lives in Seattle, going to the university up there. Uh, So I hope that he makes it down there to to check it out. But uh, I want to ask my Seattle listeners, if you've had uh, makoli at Girin, I'm very curious to know what it's like. Apparently, they have both a the full strength version and a diluted version. So, if you've had makoli at Girin or any other place in the U.S. where they're making it uh, commercially, please let me know. James at basicbrewing dot com. Very exciting news from our sponsor, Imperial Organic Yeast. I got a note from Casey at Imperial saying that they're re-releasing A forty three Loki as their seasonal yeast strain. Loki is a traditional Norwegian strain that has an extremely wide fermentation temperature range. This strain has been traditionally used in farmhouse-style beers. However, due to its fermentation temp range, it can be used in a variety of beers from pseudo-lagers, Belgian-inspired, and hop-forward beers. Uh, On the cool end of the range, Loki is super clean, producing little to no esters and phenols, but as things warm up, It tends to produce a huge fruit ester profile. Casey says she gets tons of peach when uh, when Loki is used at higher temperatures. Uh, The temperature range is 65 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 18 to 38 C. Flocculation is medium to high. Attenuation 75 to 85 percent. Casey sent me two packets of Loki from Imperial, and I plan on splitting a 10-gallon batch and fermenting half at the normal ale temperature and the other half at around 90C, or, or 90F, not, <laughs> not 90C. Woo, that would be a mistake. 90 degrees Fahrenheit, or 32C. So uh, that'll be fun. So look for Loki at your local homebrew store, including Steve's Brew Shop and High Gravity. 
Remember, Imperial Organic Yeast offers the highest cell count of any liquid yeast producer at 200 billion cells. Uh, you can be like me and just retire your stir plate for starters for five-gallon beers of standard gravity. They're uh, out of the can and into awesome, easy-to-use pouches. I love Imperial Yeast, and you will too. Look up Loki. That's A43 from Imperial. Let's take a look into the mailbag. Stephen from Salt Lake City writes, Would it be possible to steep specialty grains post-boil if it was done while the wort was still at pasteurization temperature? That's 160 to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. I've been brewing for seven and a half years, all grain for about six, and I have a mash tun large enough to produce double batches of wort. Stephen says, I'm wondering if I could produce 10 gallons of pale ale that I could split post-boil and steep one pound of pale chocolate in five gallons to make a brown ale. Well, Stephen, uh, specialty grains that aren't base malts don't need to be mashed to convert. You can just steep them. And in Gordon Strong's Brewing Better Beer, he talks about different techniques to add dark malts and specialty grains to beer. And one method he says he got from Marianne Gruber of Brees is to do a hot steep of the grains and then add them just into the fermenter. So based on that, steeping in post-boil wort that's, you know, still at pasteurization temperature sounds like it would work just fine. Just a few minutes should do the trick, I think. The drawback here is that you'd be locked into your pale ale hopping for your brown ale because it's after the boil. You've added all your hops and you've boiled and now you're, you know, ready to chill and now you've got all these hops. So if you want to make a, you know, pretty hoppy brown ale... This may be the way you want to go. So we've we've done a basic brewing video episode where Steve split his wort pre-boil and steeped specialty grains in half of that. But he basically made two small batches uh, out of that one wort. So that gives you more flexibility because you can do separate hopping. But you would have to do uh, two brew pots then. So if you're making, say, a 10-gallon batch and you're splitting it into two 5-gallon batch. Uh, batches that would uh, complicate things. So anyway, food for thought. So thanks for the, thanks for the question, Stephen. Let's talk about our friends and sponsors, Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa. I continue to hear from listeners who are purchasing electric brewing systems from High Gravity. I know that you'll be happy with with yours, as I am happy with mine. Brewing season is upon us. The weather's cooling down, uh, at least around here it is, and that means brewing without sweating which I'm very much looking forward to. But if you're brewing with propane, the cool and or cold winds are not your friends. I remember building barriers around my propane burner to try to keep the fire going and to try to keep the kettle boiling on uh, cold and windy days. Not to mention it's more dangerous to keep stuff around your open flame. With a Warthog brewing system from high gravity, your heat goes directly into the kettle directly into the water or directly into the wort through the electric element, and no more wrapping mash tons or brewing a bag kettles and blankets and towels and all that trying to keep them warm during the mash. The wort hog controller keeps your mash temperature rock steady. And no more running to the store to get another dadgum propane tank when the one that you've got unexpectedly uh, runs out. High Gravity has a wide range of single, two, and three vessel systems from five gallons to two barrels. And Dave makes those right in the back of the store. So if you have questions, uh, you can talk to the source himself. Check out all the electric brewing solutions at family-owned and operated highgravitybrew.com. And if you use the code EBC75BB, you can save 75 bucks off your electric brewing purchase. That's EBC75BB. Take the pain out of propane at highgravitybrew.com. Okay, let's talk to Tommy Cayuet about Makoli. Don't forget to stay tuned after to hear about my first batches. Well, Tommy Cayuet, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Thank you. Now, first of all, before we get started and talk about the topic of the day, give us a little background about yourself and, and how long you've been brewing and what you like to brew. Sure, yeah, I've been brewing for... Uh... About five years now, but the first couple years I was going on and off again. So I've only really been serious about it for about two and a half years or so. Uh, then uh, around that time, I jumped into all grain brewing uh, 
and moved to much smaller batch size. I live in a pretty darn small apartment, so it's uh, hard to find space for a propane tank and everything. Uh, and since then, I've really been focusing mostly on uh, wild beers uh, or trying to get to that point. Uh, again, that's another thing that's kind of hard to pull together in a small space, but it's something where you don't need quite as much fermentation control. So uh, if Saison's the easiest thing to brew, that's sure as heck what I'm going to brew. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I've been doing that for uh, about two and a half years now. Uh, been active with uh, Grist up here in Arlington, Virginia, and uh, we've had a good group that I've learned a lot from. And uh, one of the items that I learned about today was, or learned about was uh, the thing we're talking about today, Makali, uh, which is Korean rice wine. Um, yeah, you you sent me an email, and I I did an interview, uh, you know, about uh, I've done interviews about sake in the past, and and then we did uh, another show more recently of uh you know a sake beer hybrid uh and my you know my complaint about sake was that it was it, it it's intimidating it just seems hard to brew to me <laughs> and, yeah. and probably mainly because I don't know how to do it yet i think if i knew how to do it i wouldn't be intimidated by it and you know and, and it wouldn't be a big deal so you say this uh mako makoli yeah makoli makoli it's a, it's a, it, you describe it as a korean rice wine but I guess technically, you know, it doesn't have grapes. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. not it's not really a wine, as as in sake is actually a beer and not a a, a rice wine. So so how is is uh, makoli similar to and different from sake? So there's a lot it has in common. Uh, it's made from rice, and they rely on uh, the same enzyme from the same mold to break down that rice into sugars that can be uh, fermented by yeast. Uh, so, but there are the differences start pretty darn early. Um, after you cook your uh, short grain rice, and short grain rice is best because that's made of almost entirely amylose, which amylase breaks down. The longer grains have uh, another. Uh, starch in it called amylopectin, which kind of just hangs around, uh, which I realize getting, getting pretty technical really quickly. But the <laughs> trick is that <laughs> that uh, amylose breaks down into nice yummy sugars, uh, yummy for the yeast and yummy for us. Uh, and so when you uh, put in, instead of having koji, which is a uh, rice that's inoculated with aspergillus oryzae, uh, uh, the Koreans use this mixture called naruk. And Nuruk is a pounded cake of barley and rice, and it's uh, it's made in a little bit wilder standards. So um, it may not be a necessarily fair characterization, but I think of the, Jap the Japanese of being extremely regimented, sort of like the Germans. Uh, or, and I like to think of the Korean brewing style to be a little bit more free-handed, sort of like the Belgians. And like I sort of already hinted at, I've got a soft spot for the for the Belgians, so like the Korean style too. <laughs> so how does I mean it's it's unfair to characterize, but it's unfair to say how does that compare to sake because there's so many different styles and kinds right. of sake. Uh, but is there a generalization that you can uh, use to to describe the flavor of uh, of this Korean rice wine uh, as compared to sake? So one of the uh, the main difference is that uh, the Naruk carries along a lot more different bugs with it uh, than the Koji does. Koji is a pure monoculture of Aspergillus aritze. Uh Naruk comes with yeast, lactobacillus, and who knows what the heck else. <laughs> so, uh, in addition to having uh, Saccharomyces much in a way at the sugars, you've also got your lactic acid bacteria providing flavors. So uh, Makali tends to be uh, a little bit more sour, has more of that funk going on than uh, sake tends to have. It reminds me kind of like uh, um, kombucha. You know, if you have a scoby, uh, you know, which is the, the you know, the culture that, that uh, you know, ferments the, the kombucha, it's got all kinds of stuff in there. You don't know what's in there. <laughs> yeah, no, that's actually a really good comparison. <laughs> So is it so? Could I so could I take a, a like a kombucha scoby and and uh, you know create a sort of a a rice wort uh, and uh, put it in there and and come out with a similar product? Do you think? 
you know, uh, well, first, your main problem is you still really need that uh, that uh, amylase enzyme to start breaking down the uh, rice. Uh, and you get that from the koji or the niroka, the stuff that's made by the aspergillus mold. So you need that to make any sort of rice wine. Um, but after that, you know, I, I couldn't tell you. I think if you're inoculating with something interesting, you're going to get something interesting. <laughs> Somebody's writing down an experiment somewhere, <laughs> somewhere, within, awesome. somewhere within, the, within the sound of our voices. Uh, <laughs> so you get you got to break down the starches into sugars before you can you can move on. So, right. So, and um, what's really sets apart, uh, and I agree, it's not the right term, rice wine from beer is that you're mixing together the sacrification and the, the fermentation. So instead of converting all your starches on one step and then converting all the uh, sugars into alcohol and flavor in the next step, you're doing that all at the same time. Uh, that's, that's the real major difference between rice wine and beer. So it's, it's, integra- it's like carrying the mash all the way through the process. Exactly. So I think some places have labeled it parallel fermentation, hmm. but yeah, uh, it makes it really interesting. And uh, but we kind of take it for granted that there's actually an earlier step before sacrification, or that we do in parallel with sacrification with regular beer, uh, gelatinization, making that starch available uh, to the water so the enzymes can get at it. And so instead of splitting it, where with regular beer you have gelatinization and sacrification going on in the mash. What uh, makali and sake and every other rice wine is doing is you're gelatinizing the rice by cooking it, and then you're doing the sacrification and fermentation at the same time. So start us out. I mean, what first of all, what kind of uh, what's the recipe look like for a makali? Uh, it's really straightforward. Traditionally, uh, it's approximately ten parts rice, uh, and this is cooked rice. Uh, you want it to be uh, sort of an al dente chick character. Uh, so it's, it can be broken apart in water, but it's, it's still pretty well together. So 10 parts cooked rice, 10, point, uh, 10 parts water, and one part nuruk. So, and nuruk is, honestly, depending on where you live, might be a little hard to come by. Uh, around me, uh, we have a number of Asian markets, and uh, inside of uh, H-Mart, which is, I think, common nationally, uh, they have this a package that's labeled amylase enzyme or powdered enzyme amylase, something like that. It doesn't actually say Nuruk anywhere on it. Uh, you just have to talk to someone and say, hey, I'm trying to make some makali. Uh, can you help me out? <laughs> <laughs> and a guy opens a trench coat, and there yeah. it is. <laughs> Very similar to what happened to me the first time I was trying to find it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so even though it says amylase enzyme on it, it's not something you can get from White Labs, right? No. The, white, the White Labs is the, is the pure stuff. Right. And they actually uh, derive the white lab stuff in a lab from the same mold. Uh, but you're looking for the, you know, the uncut stuff, uh, the stuff that's got all the, the nasty bits with it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we're running an episode of The Wire or something. <laughs> <laughs> you've got to make sure it's not stepped on too much. You, uh, <laughs> going back to Starsky and Hutch days back in the 70s. <laughs> is it on Amazon? Have you have you tried to look on Amazon or something like that? Or are there online retailers that uh, sell uh, Nuruk and it's spelled N U R U K? Right. Uh, you know, honestly, I haven't looked at it uh, for it online. There's, I, I think, in, even in the grocery store, there might be some transportation issues. I've noticed that some batches feel a little worse off than others when I'm doing the fermentation. Hmm. Uh, like it'll be, it'll have a little bit more lactic character than. Uh, then some ba- some batches will have more lactic character than other, and, and I try to attribute that to the nuruk. nuruk. Maybe it's just me, huh. um, but I, I imagine somewhere online will sell it. Uh, but again, it, you might get further searching for like Korean amylase enzyme, something like that. You can get everything online nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we've got our we've got our rice that we've cooked uh, al dente. And uh, we've mixed it with water, and we and we have our naruk. Uh, mm-hmm. Now what? So, uh, in order to start getting a little bit more reasonable character, I kind of just let things sit for a day. Just give it a good mix. Uh, start uh, start letting the process kick off. You'll start to see a few bubbles. 
maybe give it another mix and see how it smells. And once you can start telling that there's a little bit of a lactic character to it, uh, I like to add brewer's yeast. And uh, because the package in the rook is kind of hit or miss, uh, adding that brewer's yeast is just a nice insurance policy to make sure you're getting something that actually tastes good at the end. Uh, mm-hmm. I've had some batches where 100% Nuruk, it tastes pretty reasonable, and other pack, uh, batches where it's not very good at all. It's just there's there's too much uh, wild character for me. Huh. Uh, so, uh, and, and a lot of like really basic things, they'll just say, oh, use bread yeast. But I figure I have, you know, nice, in- nice English or yeast hanging around. Uh, I might as well use that. But I typically aim for something that's a little bit lower attenuating uh, because this is a drink that you want to have while there's still some sweetness around. Now, do you, if there's a, if there's a lactic component, uh, you know, and things start to get sour, uh, if you wait, one would assume that if you wait a little too long to add the yeast, uh, it might not be a hospitable environment pH wise, uh, for no, yeah. yeast. <laughs> Probably not. Um, um, unfortunately this is a drink that's not extraordinarily well documented in English, uh, Looking throughout the internet, going on searches for days, I've come across like maybe seven or eight sources uh, that talk about this. So this is real uncharted territory, and you kind of have to go by feel. Uh, so, uh, and for some batches, I've realized, oh, I just I don't want to have to baby this for a couple of days, and I'll just pe- uh, pitch the brewer's yeast at the very start with the nerok and water and rice and in that initial mix, and it'll still come out fine. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just if you want to have a little bit more wild character, uh, holding back on that brewer's yeast will give you that. Now, is this the kind of thing where you can find a commercial example of it somewhere, or do you have buddies that do this too, or or are you just relying on your own wits? In- <laughs> so this is definitely not something I just came up with, like out of the blue thinking, oh, I need to look up Korean rice wine. Uh, there was actually another guy in my club, uh, Tyler Nelson, who did a uh, club uh education session on Makali, and I'm definitely stealing his thunder by, being, by talking to you. Uh, <laughs> so uh, his in-laws are Korean, and they introduced him to Makali, and as, and then he passed along that knowledge to us. So I've had a little bit of his uh, stuff, and uh, but there are commercial examples that you can have. Uh, however, uh, like I mentioned with shipping it to you, um, it it's hard to get good fresh mockley out in the world uh it's a product that's sold still active before fermentation is really complete so you have to pasteurize it and that obviously doesn't work with modern supply chains so things that you can get in the store will have some of the general characters it's a it's a little sweet uh there's this fruity character to it uh that sort of thing but it will lack a lot of the deeper complexity that you get from having the the various other bacteria in there because they've been pasteurized. Hmm. Yeah, we didn't mention that the reason I, I'm not sipping on some right now is you you were afraid it might blow up between here and <laughs> between your house and my house. <laughs> yeah. So that's it's better to be prudent in that regard. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I mentioned this to you. Uh, I brought a bottle da- down to my parents uh, over Christmas, and I managed to almost blow that one up a several times in the drive down, and that wasn't that long. So, <laughs> the hot potato of the uh, beverage, alcoholic beverage world. Um, so, do you take a do you take a, a like a beginning gravity of the you know? Can you take a like a hydrometer reading of the so called? Well, it'd be, it'd be hard to do because you're you're. You're st- at the beginning. It's starch and not sugar. So it's can you get an accurate gravity reading or an estimate when you begin? So this is something I've had a lot of fun trying to figure out, uh, and I eventually worked out a system where basically I, I take my brewing bucket and figure out how much volume of everything is in there, and then I weigh my bucket and just assume that I'm doing my measurements correctly and do a specific gravity, say, well, I have this volume, it should be equal to this much water, but I'm really seeing this much weight, therefore I have a specific gravity of like 1.180, which is, I believe, where I was uh, at the beginning of my last brew. Wow. That's smart. So, See, I wouldn't think of that. 
<laughs> wouldn't yeah. have thought of that. One point one eight zero. That's oh yeah, that's big. It's it's big, and it also varies a little uh, depending on you know how accurate I measure out everything. Uh, because this is a really rough process, I use that as an excuse to turn off my you know more practical brewing self and just kind of screw around. <laughs> You're channeling the Belgians again. Exactly. <laughs> it's more art than uh, than science, maybe. Right. Uh, so do that sort of like uh, measure the weight of the bucket and everything. You can actually uh, measure the uh, the weight of that bucket over time, and you'll start seeing uh, mass off gas in the form of CO two, and you can actually track how much uh, alcohol you're approximately getting. Wow. So, I love science. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so you got your yeast uh, in there fermenting after a few days, uh, and does it does it look like a beer fermentation after that? So, because the rice is still kind of in clumps and looking like rice generally, uh, you'll see this really interesting phenomena where at the very beginning, when you mix everything together, uh, the rice tends to float because you've cooked it and it's got this water in it, and then over the course of the approximately week total a week of fermentation total, uh, you'll start seeing rice grain just kind of float down to the bottom and just uh, you'll get these bands of like rice that is sunken, a little band of liquid and rice that's still floating. And I generally use uh, when most of the rice is sunk to the bottom as my, sure, that seems about right uh, time. Hmm. Uh, take it out. Uh, going by that visual indicator and just the sense of smell, because you'll uh, as it's fermenting, it'll smell uh, more and more sweet. Uh, I found that to be the best indicator of when it's time to take this thing off because you want to get it while there's while there is a, a good deal of sweetness to it. So it smells more sweet the 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 longer the fermentation goes along. I think it's just a byproduct of like uh, sugar off gassing with the CO two, but that's wild speculation. So how how much do you, do you have an, an estimate of percentage wise of how much sugar that, that you ferment over that time? Um, usually, I get about sixty percent attenuation, I believe, uh, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, if you let it go, it will ferment all the way out because of who knows what's in the nerook. Um, but I, I generally aim for. Uh, about 60% attenuation because you'll still have a lot of that sweetness hanging around. And will you will it get more funky as time goes on too? It'll get more funky, but it'll also get a lot more harsh. Um, without that balancing sweetness, uh, everything just becomes a little bit more raw. You sort of get this uh, a, a little bit like an astringency going on, uh, but definitely a lot more sourness and uh there tend to be more negative byproducts like fuel alcohols and that sort of thing that come up. Yeah, it sounds like you could make rocket fuel easily if you let it go too long. Right. And I don't know what all yeasts are in there, but they will go all the way to zero. I've accidentally let it do that before. <laughs> <laughs> Did you wind up dumping that batch? Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is definitely a, uh, an art that I've had to throw several out. Uh, I've made, I think, six batches this year so far, and I've liked four of them maybe. Hmm. Um, but it's also a really low like, input uh, cost for you. Uh, I mean, a pound of rice or so, or two pounds of rice, and maybe an hour and a half of work, if that. Yeah, yeah. So you can afford to be experimental. Exactly. So, if, so once the fermentation gets to a point where you think it's going to be good, what do you do then? Uh, at that point, uh, their fermentation should still be slowly going, but uh, what you do is you pour it out into – I pour it out in just a big old bowl. I, I only make about a gallon or so at a time of that as well. Uh, and I never clarified. I tend to do this in an open ferment uh, – like a big open fermenter jar so that I can stick my face in there and smell it hmm. uh, really easily. There's no reason to airlock this because you already don't know what's in there in my opinion. So <laughs> – <laughs> Get a little local terroir there with <laughs> exactly. But anyways, once it's finished, uh, at that point you uh, start making the makali actually makali. Uh, uh, the literal translation of it is thing that is roughly strained. Uh, so I take a cheesecloth uh, and a funnel and just pour it through the cheesecloth, 
and you'll start to see the rice kind of break down inside the cheesecloth as uh, bits and pieces of the rice flow through, but the larger pieces stick uh, stick up with you. And it's really critical to have those rice product particles in the drink. Uh, that's going to carry over some more sweetness, and it's also going to give the drink a, lot, a little bit more body. Very important to keep that along. And uh, then once you're ready to bottle, uh, it's best to do this in a PET bottle. Uh, just I have, I think, some old Mountain Dew bottles or something like that. And uh, I'll just throw it into there. So if something does burst, at least it's not glass you're cleaning up. Mm-hmm. So, uh, And that's also traditionally how it's actually st- sold. So if you go to the store and actually find some Makalee, it'll be in a plastic soda bottle looking thing. Huh. If you've ever heard a, a PET bottle burst, as I have done in the middle of the night, it it's something to behold. But at least it's not <laughs> it's not shattered glass uh, all over everywhere. I, I accidentally uh, uh, double primed uh, a PET bottle one time, and and uh, uh, it blew the bottom out of it. <laughs> It'll wake you up for sure. Man, uh, so I've been lucky enough to not actually have any blow up on me yet um so been lucky but uh, basically as soon as i finish bottling uh i might let them sit on the counter for a couple hours to start building up a little pressure but i'll throw them in the fridge pretty quickly now do you do you bottle at full strength oh uh no thank you um typically so well like i mentioned you start out at 1180 or so i think my last batch got down to uh, i don't know it was in it was in the 11 to 10 or 11 percent range uh, when I pulled it, uh, based on my really coarse method. So I tend to water it down by about a third. Uh, you're shooting for something that's in the six to 9% range. If you go too much thinner than that, uh, the drink's fairly thin and it's, it's not quite as palatable. Uh, and you can drink it strong, but it's just not as traditional and you might as well enjoy the stuff for a little bit longer. Mm hmm. Yeah, it seems like you'd. Uh, it, it it might be uh, good in like a little shot or something at full strength, but uh, uh, you want something that you can actually enjoy with a, with a meal or something, right? I would and think. there actually is. Uh, there are forms of mockley that are where you follow the same pr- uh, procedure up until the packaging point, and then you kind of take a left turn and do something else. There's a there's a version called uh, Dong Dong Ju, which is basically means floating things and instead of straining it you just kind of ladle off the top liquid and try to avoid the rice at the bottom but you'll get some little floating rice bits up at the top and that's meant to be enjoyed fairly strong Hmm. Uh, so mockley to give you a little bit more context and uh uh, for korean culture at least as i understand it uh mockley is kind of considered this farmer's drink uh it's not a refined uh drinks like uh, soju uh, which is also made in a fairly similar pro- uh, process, but then it's uh, really well refined and then distilled. So this is the crazy farmer juice, and <laughs> Jew is the really, really crazy farmer juice. So. <laughs> I can I can just uh, envision the the label for a uh, <laughs> you know, for a can of uh, crazy farmer juice. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it might look like you mentioned Mountain Dew. It might look like the uh, Mountain Dew bottles from the uh, 70s. I don't know. Uh, there, there may be a pig on there. Uh, well, it's actually gotten like uh, it's come back into the mainstream. Uh, my wife and I were flying through Korea last year, uh, and our one goal was to find actual Makali in Korea. And uh, we we went into the touristy area of Seoul. And they have little tour guides sitting around everywhere, uh, government-sponsored, just to help all the English speakers find their way around. And it was about noon, and we walked up to him and we say, hey, where can we find Mockley? And the look that came across his face was something to behold. <laughs> like, who are you people? How do you know what Mockley is in the first place? And are you aware it's only 10 a.m.? <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> Did you find some? Yeah, so... Despite that look, he did point us to a very lovely uh, restaurant that was only like a block away. And th- throughout Seoul, there's a number of extremely reputable bars where you can find any number of variations on Makali. Uh So it's, it's much like craft beer here. Makali there is making a bit of a comeback. So did you find some that, that uh, was similar to what you've been making? 
you know, that was one thing that kind of surprised me. It was similar. Um, we got one relatively standard Makali, and it had the same uh, characteristics, this kind of ricey sweetness, uh, or um, kind of a floral character from the uh, uh, various microflora, and a nice brightness. Uh, those same characters were there. The Korean one was obviously a little bit better, uh, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> But another thing we had there, and something that's pretty common, is a uh, was a fruit makgeolli. Um, now that's something I haven't really done a lot of looking into, uh, but it, it is extremely traditional to add in any number of flavorings during the fermentation process in order to make, say, a peach makgeolli, a mango makgeolli, what have you. Huh. Now, how tart is is the finished product? Oh, uh, I wouldn't even put it up to the point of like a Berlin or Weiss. It should be in that neighborhood, but maybe a little bit less bright. And part of that's sort of the the, the full-bodiedness you get from the rice, I think, uh, should probably be in the same neighborhood of the pH. But it will be significantly more acidic than, say, sake. Ah, so it's not it's not a sour. You would, wouldn't characterize it as necessarily a sour drink, just more of kind of a, kind of a lemonade-y kind of uh, level of, of sourness? Yeah, it's something that, uh, again, I'll just say it makes it taste kind of fruity. Uh, like if you're biting into a peach, you don't think of a peach as being terribly acidic, even though it is relatively acidic. It, it just gives it that brightness. It sounds like a nice balance to the sweetness. Yeah, it, it is a nice balance to the sweetness. And the sweetness shouldn't be anything, you know, like a pastry stuff either. The sweetness is just there to, you know, provide a, a flavor there beyond just the, the yeast character. And w what would you pair this with food-wise? So I'm, I love having makgeolli with uh, spicy noodle dishes. Mm -hmm. uh, I cannot find a beer that I really love with spicy dishes, uh, especially something that really makes you want to cry if you have you know a good plate of drunken noodles or something. Uh, to me, that's, that's where makgeolli really shines. Uh, it provides a nice... Uh, safe haven when you're uh, suffering a little bit. <laughs> super, super, uh, I see. Well, this, so this sounds like something that I, that I could do. Uh, you know, if I were to, uh, if I were to, you know, find the ingredients, that's the tricky part, I guess. And we do have some, some Asian markets around Northwest Arkansas now. Uh, and maybe, you know, it's worth a, a trip to those to find some Nuruk and some short grain rice. So I'd say especially if you can find the short grain rice, uh, that's absolutely critical. Um, one thing that I've been meaning to experiment with but really haven't is just uh, tossing in the BSG or White Labs or what have you, uh, amylase enzyme, and seeing what normal uh, yeast does with that. Uh, I can't promise anything good, but it might be interesting. Well, you want the. It seems like to me you want you want the funky stuff. You want the <laughs> the yeah. wild card of of uh, you know the the uh, the kind of non-pure culture to to give you some some kind of a depth of of character, um, right? So that's what the house sour culture is for, man. Just leaving it open. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you put a cheesecloth or something over the top of your of your jug to make sure that the flies don't get in there or the or the, yeah. the bugs? Yeah, I just have a little cheesecloth that I put over it. That's probably a smart thing. Uh, you never know what what might fall in there. <laughs> and you were mentioning kombucha. I actually leave it right next to my wife's kombucha fermentation area, so I imagine there's some cross contamination going on there too. <laughs> oh well, there you go. Keep, keeping it all in the family there on the countertop. Right. <laughs> well, Tommy, is there anything else that we've that we've missed? Um. Well, I said that this is something I try to be pretty easy going with uh this is also something that you try to you, you don't want it to ferment way too hot uh i've gotten much better results when uh it's fermenting at you know the lower side of room temperature rather than the hotter side for a while i was fermenting it in the kitchen and i've gotten better results when i've taken taken it off the uh kitchen counter uh, other than that it's it's something that takes a few uh tries to get it where you exactly want it but if you just start going in, the, the the first batch is hopefully going to be as good as your first batch of beer. <laughs> <laughs> Which is also a good one. <laughs> I had a boil over my first batch. It was 
Well, you're not going to get those here. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> as long as you know how to cook rice. Right. <laughs> so I have an instant pot, so you know it should be should be fairly easy to cook rice. Um, so that's actually an interesting point of contention in the mockley making community as so it exists that I can see. Uh, very traditionally, it's something that you should be steaming your rice for. But uh, the one time, and usually I go through the effort of steaming the rice, just put like a colander over a boiling pot of water and put the rice in a cheesecloth inside there and just cover it, let it go for like 30 minutes or so. But one time I actually did it in the Instant Pot, and it turned out just fine. The problem is the Instant Pot tends to overcook things just slightly, so you have to be a little bit more manageable, uh, managing of your time there. Ah, well, that's good advice. All right, Tommy, this has been fun. I, I'm going to look – I'm going to – I swear, I keep – you know, when I talk about sake, I swear I'm going to try it. But this, this sounds more manageable. I think it can actually yeah. do this. Yeah, let me know how it uh, turns out. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me on. Well, thanks again to Tommy. As I mentioned before, I jumped right into making makgeolli after talking to him. Uh, it just sounded so easy. Turns out it is easy. I found a, a Korean grocery store in Fayetteville, Arkansas, which is a very neat store with lots of things that I have no idea what they are. <laughs> but I'd love to try. Um, I asked the woman running the store for Nuruk, and she looked at me kind of, puzzlingly and didn't know what I was saying at first. And then she said, oh, Nuruk. So pronunciation counts, apparently. So I bought a one pound bag for five bucks. I also bought some sushi rice, too. So I measured one kilogram of dry sushi rice or short grain rice uh, and then washed it. Uh, and then after washing it, I cooked it in the Instant Pot with one liter of water. And I apparently don't know what I'm doing there because some of the rice stuck to the bottom of the pot. So i got to figure that out. Regardless, the rest of it tasted fine. So I mixed that rice in a one-gallon jug with a liter of water, 100 grams or about a cup of nuruk, and a packet of bread yeast. And it didn't take long for the rice to start breaking down. I was really surprised. I started a couple of times each day for the first three days and then left it alone. And the fermentation became pretty vigorous after a while. You could hear it. It's kind of like Rice Krispies coming up, you know, bubbling through there. And you could see the bubbles rising up through the, the stuff. So by the 10th day, fermentation looked pretty much finished, and the rice began to separate from a clear liquid that was on the top. So I used some mesh bags to, to filter it, and then I bottled it. So my process was different from Tommy's in a couple of ways. I added my yeast right at the beginning, uh, and I waited until it looked like the fermentation was complete before I bottled. So also, I, I hit a snag at bottling time because the first mesh bag I tried was was kind of a big hop bag. And the weave was really tight. And it was too tight because the stuff didn't want to come out. So I transferred to an old brew-in-a-bag bag, and I got better results. But I think next time... I'm going to go with just simple cheesecloth and, and filter it even more roughly. So the resulting first batch is delicious. I tried, you know, diluting some of it in the glass, but I didn't like it as much as the full strength stuff. So I can tell it's got a lot of alcohol, but the sweetness of that milky rice stuff, I don't know what to call it, uh, balances it out nicely. It's not funky or sour which it might have been if I had delayed putting in the bread yeast, so I might try that with a later batch. So yesterday, I started my second batch. Everything was the same, including <laughs> screwing up the rice in the Instant Pot and <laughs> sticking it to the bottom of the pot. But the one thing that I changed was to add Saf Ale WB06 instead of the bread yeast, about half a pack of that. So I wanted to see if I could get some banana or clove characteristics in with that kind of milky, ricey characteristic. So um, I put a lid on this time with an airlock on the jar instead of just a paper towel with a rubber band, which is what I did on the first one. And that was interesting because I was able to see that there was activity only a few hours after pitching the, airlock, uh, pitching the, the yeast and putting it all together. Because I saw the airlock bubbling, and I would have not would not have known that otherwise, because there was no visible signs of fermentation. So, 
I start I, I stirred it this morning and it was already starting to break down and become a little more soupy. So uh, anyway, stay tuned. I'm sh- I'm shooting video for an upcoming uh, basic brewing video episode, which should be a lot of fun. So. If you have, if you want to share your Makali uh, experience, or if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, just want to say howdy, write to James at basicbrewing.com, or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com, and please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check all that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. Get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo, and you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store, too. You can find our logbooks where you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. Check all that out at basicbrewingshop.com. Also, take a look at our silicone pints. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voice, and we'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.